Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for joining us today on this cold day. Uh, as always, please, if you can, uh, silence your cell phone so we can avoid any interruptions. Uh, my name is Mohammed Mohammed. I'm the executive director here at the Jerusalem Fund and Palestine Center. Uh, on, our, on behalf of our board of directors and our staff, it's a pleasure to welcome you all here today. Uh, it's also uh, a pleasure to welcome our online audience. Uh, and of course, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome back our uh, distinguished speaker, uh, Josh Rubner, uh, who will be discussing his latest book uh, called Israel, Democracy or Apartheid State. So 2017 marked a year of significant milestones in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, 100 years ago, a uh, little more, the British government issued the Balfour Declaration, calling for the establishment of a Jewish national home in Palestine. Uh, seven years ago, the UN recommended the partition of Palestine into two states, a Jewish state and an Arab state, uh, and the decision paved the way for, an for the establishment of the State of Israel a year later on 78% of historic Palestine, amid widespre uh, widespread ethnic cleansing of indigenous Palestinian inhabitants. And 50 years ago, uh, Israel militarily occupied the Palestinian West Bank, including East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip, uh, and that's an occupation which endures to this day. In light of these milestones, Josh draws on personal anecdotes and reflections, uh, historical documents, and legal analyses to answer one of the most pressing issues in, inter in international affairs today, which is, is Israel a democracy, or does, it, uh, does its separate and unequal treatment of the Palestinian people render it an apartheid state. With President Donald Trump's willingness to explore a one-state resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the question gains immediacy, uh, as Josh argues that any settlement of the conflict must be based on freedom, dignity, and equality. It's a little bit about, uh, about Josh. Uh, he is a policy, uh, the policy director of the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights, which is a national coalition of hundreds of organizations working together for freedom, justice, and equality for Palestinians. He is a former analyst in Middle East Affairs at Congressional uh, Research Service, which is a federal government agency providing members of Congress with policy analysis. Uh, Josh holds a graduate degree in International Affairs from Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies here in Washington. His analysis and commentary on U.S. policy toward the Middle East uh, appear frequently in media such as NBC, ABC Nightline, C-SPAN, Al Jazeera, uh, USA Today, uh, Los Angeles Times, The Hill, Huffington Post, and he's also the author of Shattered Hopes, Obama's Failure to Broker Israeli-Palestinian Peace. Uh, Josh will speak for 30 to 40 minutes, after which we will have a Q&A session. Uh, we ask that you please wait for the mic to come to you before you... Uh, ask your question so that everyone online can also hear. Uh, for the online audience, you can tweet your questions to uh, uh, at Palestine Center. Uh, and also, we, we're going to have signed copies of the book available for purchase after the talk. So uh, please grab a copy on your way out. Uh, without further ado, please welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Josh Rubner. Thank you very much, Mohammed, for that kind introduction, and thank you to the Palestine Center for inviting me here today to launch my book, Israel, Democracy, or Apartheid State, and thank you all for coming out on this cold day, and thanks to you watching uh, at home or at the office via computer. It's difficult to imagine two more polar opposite personalities and political figures in the history of apartheid South Africa than Hendrik Verwoerd and Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Today, Verwoerd is largely a forgotten figure outside of his homeland of South Africa, but he was nevertheless a key, the instrumental person in constructing modern-day 20th century apartheid in South Africa when he served as the country's prime minister during the formative years of the development of modern apartheid. Desmond Tutu, on the other hand, is an iconic figure revered around the world for his spiritual and moral and political organizing against apartheid and in his leadership in the transition to a post-apartheid democratic South Africa leading the Truth and Reconciliation Committee there. 
So to have two opposite figures like Verwood and Tutu, it's hard to imagine. But in one respect, they agreed on something politically, which is hard to fathom. And that is Israel's treatment of the Palestinian people. Verwood said in a 1961 interview that, quote, the Jews took Israel from the Arabs after the Arabs had lived there for 1,000 years. Israel, like South Africa, is an apartheid state. On the other hand of the political spectrum, you have Archbishop Desmond Tutu writing in The Guardian in 2002 in an article entitled Apartheid in the Holy Land that his visit there, quote, reminded me so much of what happened to us black people in South Africa. So here you have, from the polar extremes, the establisher of modern-day apartheid and one of the people most credited with its dismantling agreeing that Israel does, in fact, practice apartheid toward the Palestinian people. What better authorities could we have than that? But too often the debate in the United States about whether Israel does or does not practice apartheid toward the Palestinian people revolves around a mistaken conception and a mistaken comparison whether Israel is or is not like South Africa. And in many respects, Israel is very different than apartheid South Africa was. For example, and Israel's defenders and promoters in the United States will tell you this, that Israel is not an apartheid state because Israel allows what they call Arab Israelis, in other words, denationalized Palestinian indigenous citizens of the state of Israel. They offer the enfranchisement, the vote, to Palestinian citizens of Israel. And furthermore, Israel's supporters will point to the fact that in the last decade, a judge by the name of Salim Jubran became the first Palestinian citizen of Israel to be appointed to Israel's Supreme Court. So how can you say that Israel practices apartheid when it indeed appoints a Palestinian member to its highest court? Very good points, indeed. But in assessing whether Israel does or does not practice apartheid toward the Palestinian people, whether Israel is or is not like apartheid South Africa was, is immaterial to the discussion. Because even though the word apartheid comes to us via the South African political context, meaning apart in Afrikaners, the word as a political term gained an international significance in 1973 when the UN passed what's called the Convention on the Suppression and Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid. So apartheid has been taken out of its specific South African context and given a specific definition under international law. And according to this convention, apartheid is defined as, quote, legislative measures calculated to prevent a racial group from participation in the political, social, economic, and cultural life of the country. The convention goes on to enumerate specific examples of what constitutes acts of apartheid. And here are just a few of the very many that are considered apartheid under international law. Denying groups, quote, basic human rights and freedoms, quote, the right to leave and to return to their country, the right to a nationality, and the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and association. So when we take these definitions and we look at the context of Israel's policies toward the Palestinian people, we have a lens through which to judge and assess whether Israel's policies do indeed constitute apartheid or not. And I would argue that not only has Israel instituted many specific legislative measures that are designed to prevent Palestinians from taking part in political, economic, and social life, but I would argue, moreover, that the entire superstructure of the state of Israel is designed in such a way through the entirety of its legal system. And in fact, by mandating that the international community accept it as a, quote, Jewish state, rather than a state of all of its citizens, what Israel, in essence, is doing is asking the international community to acquiesce 
in a legal situation in which Jewish Israelis enjoy the privilege of more political rights and a country for them to the detriment of the indigenous Palestinian population over whom Israel has ruled for the past 70 years. One, I think, of the best examples of these types of legislative measures that so openly promote discrimination based on race and based on religion is what's called the Jewish National Fund Law. This was a law passed by the Israeli parliament in the early 1950s after the Nakba, the Palestinian catastrophe, where Israel dispossessed the majority of indigenous Palestinian populations of their homes and their lands, demolishing more than 500 villages, destroying 11 Palestinian urban centers, and turning the vast majority of Palestinians into refugees. Israel appropriated most of that land that was taken from these refugees and turned it into public and state lands. And then Israel turned around and passed this Jewish National Fund law which gives quasi-governmental powers to a non-governmental organization, the Jewish National Fund, to administer these lands on behalf of the state of Israel, to lease them, to develop them, etc. And in the charter of the Jewish National Fund, it says quite explicitly that the land of Israel is not to be administered and developed on behalf of the people who live there, but on behalf of the Jewish people worldwide. So you have a discriminatory charter to the JNF, which is again tasked with Israel with the leasing and developing of public and state lands. Here you have as an essential component a foundational aspect of the state of Israel, an inherently discriminatory policy. Now, we could easily talk for the next 45 minutes about all of the specific policies that Israel engages in that constitute apartheid under the definitions enumerated under the UN Convention. We could, example, for example, point to the fact that Israel for the last 70 years has denied Palestinian refugees their internationally guaranteed right of return to the homes and lands from which they either fled or were expelled from by force by Israel in 1948. And instead of allowing those refugees to exercise their human right, on top of this, Israel has enacted a law called the Law of Return, which enables a Jewish person to claim automatic citizenship within the state and to move there, sometimes actually living in the very same properties that Palestinians were dispossessed of in 1948. We can look at Israel's segregated, separate, and unequal school system. Some nearly... 80 years after Brown versus Board of Education ruled that separate was always unequal in the United States and did away with formal segregation in U.S. education, this paradigm still is the rule for Israeli educational institutions. They are strictly segregated by language, with Palestinian Arabic-speaking schools within Israel receiving substantially less money in terms of governmental allocations solely on the basis that they are Palestinians and, at best, second-degree citizens of the state. We can look to the fact that Palestinians living under military occupation since 1967 in the West Bank, in Gaza, are denied even the most basic and fundamental political rights. In fact, the very first military order that Israel imposed on Palestinians in the occupied territories in August of 1967, Military Order Number 101, which still stands today, makes it illegal for Palestinians to wave a Palestinian flag. You can go to jail for waving a Palestinian flag under Israeli military occupation. You can also go to jail if you participate in a protest or any type of political gathering of 10 people or more because under Israeli military orders, all Palestinian political gatherings are illegal, bar none. Not to mention the fact that the millions of Palestinians under Israeli military occupation have no voters say in the government that rules over their lives. So we could go on and enumerate all of these separate and unequal apartheid policies that Israel enacts toward the Palestinian people, but I don't want to do that. What I want to do in the time remaining is to be a bit more optimistic and to focus on why I think 
Israel's separate and unequal regime of rule over the Palestinian people is bound to fail. And I'm going to give you three, three reasons why I think that this is the case. Number one, the patina, the veneer of an Israeli liberal democracy is peeling and it's eroding very quickly. This notion that because Israel has a parliament that it is a democracy has convinced the West and people in the United States in particular for many, many decades that Israel in fact is a country based on equal rights for all the people over whom it rules. South Africa also had a parliament, but that didn't make it a democracy either. And the patina of this democracy, I think, is eroding very quickly thanks to the actions of Israel itself and its extremist government. We have a number of different issues that are converging to demolish this facade of Israel being a functioning liberal democracy of equality. We had a number of significant anniversaries in 2017, as Mohammed mentioned at the outset. We also have a number of significant commemorations coming up in 2018, including the 70th anniversary of the Nakba, the dispossession of Palestinians and the establishment of Israel and the ruins of Palestinian society in more than three quarters of historic Palestine. And we mark this tragic event not only as an event of history, but in recognition that the process of displacement, the process of Israel's dispossession of the Palestinian people is not a historical occurrence alone, but is an ongoing present day occurrence. That there has been a Nakba going on for the past 70 years in an in, un, uninterrupted fashion. And when people view how the Palestinian Bedouin village of al al Arkib has been treated by Israel in the past few years, the veneer of Israeli democracy vanishes because Israel has demolished this Palestinian village of its own citizens more than 100 times to try to take the Palestinian Bedouin population and place it in reservations to free up additional land for Israeli Jewish colonization of the southern part of the country. So the dispossession, the demolition of Palestinian citizens' homes in the Negev Desert, the Naqab Desert, really looks no different from the dispossession and the demolishing of Palestinian villages just across the green line, the erased green line, in the West Bank. Was to differentiate the bulldozers demolishing Susia in the South Hebron Hills from the demolition of this Palestinian Bedouin village within Israel proper. We have seen earlier this month the spectacle of the Vice President of the United States traveling to Israel and giving a quasi pseudo biblical theological justification for the Trump administration's unmitigated and unprecedented support for Israel's extremist right-wing agenda. And the way in which Palestinian members of Israel's parliament were treated during Mike Pence's visit is again an indication to the West that the patina of Israeli democracy is wearing thin. Because, as you probably saw, these Palestinian members of the Israeli parliament protested the Trump administration's decision to unilaterally recognize Israel, excuse me, Jerusalem, as Israel's undivided capital, and held up posters to the effect that Jerusalem is the capital of Palestine. And they were very quickly and summarily and roughly handled, manhandled out of the auditorium by Israeli security to overwhelming cheers and laughs from the Israeli Jewish parliamentarians. And this prompted Andrea Mitchell, the foreign affairs correspondent for NBC News, to tweet something to the effect of, can you imagine the Capitol Police 
doing this to members of the Congressional Black Caucus for protesting something in the U.S. Congress. And that tweet has been liked 10,000 times as of this morning. So when you have someone like Andrea Mitchell, who is certainly no flaming radical ideologue for Palestine, making these connections and seeing the reality of Israel's rule over the Palestinians within the house of its so-called democracy, you know that the veneer is wearing thin. Today, January 31st, is also the 17th birthday of Ahed Tamimi, who, as many of you know, is a Palestinian teenage prisoner within Israel's military court system who was filmed pushing and kicking an Israeli soldier who had invaded her property in the West Bank village of Nabi Saleh back in December. Ahed is now sitting alone in solitary confinement for some of this time, for an indeterminate amount of time on nondescript charges in which she could face up to 10 years in prison, in jail, for having the temerity to defend her rights and her property and her land from invading occupation soldiers. And Ahed's imprisonment is shining an unprecedented spotlight on Israel's separate and unequal military court system in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip where Palestinians and Palestinian children can be picked up, often in the middle of the night, where Israeli soldiers knock down their doors at four in the morning, grab the children out of bed, hustle them off to interrogation, where they're often abused and sometimes even tortured, and then railroaded through a process to force a confession into something that they often didn't commit, written in a language that they don't necessarily understand, and sentenced to time in Israeli custody through this military court system. Israel is the only country in the world that systematically and routinely prosecutes children through Israeli military courts. So we often hear from Israel's def defenders and supporters that we shouldn't single Israel out. We shouldn't hold Israel to a different standard. But guess what? Israel is doing that to itself by insisting that it and it alone can do things like haul children through a military court system lacking in fundamental due process regulations. Also, as was mentioned earlier, I believe this year is also the 25th anniversary of the Oslo Accords back in 1993 when President Bill Clinton presided over a signing ceremony between the Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and the PLO Chair Yasser Arafat, designed to inaugurate a five-year process to establish a Palestinian state and resolve the Israeli-Palestinian issue once and for all. Many people viewed this as a huge historical breakthrough and were very optimistic when it occurred. But I don't think I'm being too bold or too radical to predict that no one will be celebrating the 25th anniversary this fall. On the contrary, it will be an opportunity to eulogize the so-called peace process because it has been buried once and for all by the Trump administration's insistent backing for Netanyahu's agenda. When the Israeli Prime Minister won re-election last time, in 2013 I believed, he won re-election on the premise that under his watch there will never be a Palestinian state, ever. This is what he promised his voters. And his party and his governing coalition are taking every possible step to ensure that this indeed will not be the case. A few months ago, Likud, the ruling governing party within the coalition, adopted a new platform that calls for the annexation by Israel of the Palestinian West Bank. And indeed, there are bills in the Israeli parliament currently working their way through the legislative process to actually annex different Israeli settlement blocks to Israel. So the veneer of Israel supporting a Palestinian state has also disappeared. All of these things are combining, I think, to produce a radical 
new understanding within the United States and the world in general, for those who haven't caught on yet, of Israel's true nature and intent and its policies toward the Palestinian people. So that's number one. The veneer is wearing off. Number two, the second reason why I believe that Israel's separate and unequal policies toward the Palestinian people will not stand the test of time is because of an emerging partisan divide on this issue within the United States. And this here is key to understanding how we use our privilege here in the United States as citizens of the global superpower, as citizens who are de facto supporting Israel's separate and unequal policies toward the Palestinian people, how we can take action to help end these policies. Now, Donald Trump has only helped to accelerate a process that was already well underway before he came into office. And for this development, I again think that we can thank the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who went out of his way to humiliate and abase President Barack Obama and to show where his political ideology and notions of allies laid with the Republican Party. And of course, this was demonstrated time and again, most notably through his speech to the Congress back in 2015 in an attempt to try to scuttle President Obama's Iran nuclear deal. But under Trump, this process of Israel becoming a cause celeb of the right in America has only accelerated. And when you look at the composition of Trump's advisors on Israel-Palestine, you can see that not only has Trump backed Israel to an unprecedented degree, but Trump has backed the most extremist versions of Israeli politics and Israeli society through these appointments that he's made. And I'll just touch on them briefly. First, we have as U.S. Ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, a person who not only wrote ideologically in support of Israel's retention of what he referred to as Judea and Samaria, but was actually a key fundraiser raising tens of millions of dollars for a key Israeli settlement in the Ramallah district. This is the person who is now representing U.S. policy in Tel Aviv shortly to be in Jerusalem by 2019, according to our Vice President Mike Pence. We have, of course, Donald Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, who, as I write in this book, his family was so close to Netanyahu that on a fundraising swing through the United States, Netanyahu came by and stayed at the Kushner house in New Jersey, <coughs> displacing Jared from his childhood bedroom for one night so that he could sleep there. This is how close the relationships are between the Kushner family and the Netanyahu family. And then we also have Jason Greenblatt, who served as one of Donald Trump's attorneys and whose only experience prior to being appointed Trump's key person on international negotiations, his only prior experience on this issue was actually living in an Israeli settlement and studying there. These people, combined with the Messianic Christian Zionism embodied by Vice President Mike Pence, are the four people who are driving U.S. policy toward Israel. And they explain more than anything else the decisions that we've seen in recent weeks to take Jerusalem off the table, in Trump's words, by recognizing it as Israel's capital, by trying to take the issue of Palestine refugees off of the table, by attempting to eviscerate UNRWA, and who knows what else will be coming down the line. This identification of the Trump administration with the most ideological far right of the Israeli political spectrum has its twin 
in how Israelis view the Trump administration as well. Now, all over the world, admiration, respect for U.S. leadership has plummeted under the Trump administration. I can't imagine why. <laughs> Support for U.S. leadership globally is about 30% right now. That's how much respect people around the world have for U.S. values and U.S. leadership at this point in time. Now, there are only four countries that have seen dramatic improvements in how their country views U.S. leadership under the Trump era, one of which is Israel. And Israel's approval rating of U.S. global leadership has actually skyrocketed under President Trump from about 50% under President Obama all the way now up to two-thirds, 67%. 67% of Israelis support the Trump administration's leadership in foreign affairs. So this goes to show the degree to which both the U.S. right and the Israeli society and government has, have chosen to align themselves together. And this is having dramatic ramifications in terms of how this issue is discussed and debated politically in the United States. Those numbers, by the way, were from a January 2018 Gallup poll. Another very interesting poll came out just a few days ago by Pew. Pew does an annual survey of Americans' attitudes towards Israelis and Palestinians and the Israeli-Palestinian issue. The almost complete identification of the GOP with Israel is now complete. There are now 79% of self-identified Republicans who sympathize more with Israel and only 6% of Republicans who sympathize more with Palestinians. Democrats, however, continuing a trend that we've seen emerging for the past five years, are now actually evenly split in their sympathies. Statistically, it's a dead heat. 27% of self-identified Democrats sympathize more with Israel. 25% sympathize more with Palestinians. And when you break down those numbers further into self-identified liberal Democrats, in other words, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, support and sympathy for Palestinians outnumbers that for Israel by a margin of almost two to one now. This is a huge, unprecedented development. It's the largest partisan divide in decades of reporting on this issue. And what it means for Democrats in Congress, in state legislatures, is that they know the base of their party is not behind Israel anymore and is increasingly sympathetic to Palestinian rights. And we're seeing very well how this is playing out in Washington, D.C. For example, shortly after Trump was inaugurated, he said something about building a wall on the border with Mexico. And perhaps you remember this, Benjamin Netanyahu put out a tweet in response basically saying, what a great idea this is. Our wall has worked so well for us. This was followed by an indignant and blistering letter in response, public statement from the Congressional Hispanic Caucus excoriating Netanyahu for getting involved in U.S. domestic politics and try to interfere in such a blatantly racist and xenophobic way. That type of thing would have been unprecedented just a few years ago. And in fact, we're seeing members of Congress, from the Democratic side at least, become more and more willing to I wouldn't even say stick their necks out. It's not an issue of sticking their necks out anymore. It used to be. 2010, five years ago, there were only a handful of members of Congress you could count on to do the right thing on this issue. But today, easily, I would say, easily, there's an emerging block of 40 Democratic members of Congress, both senators and representatives, who can be consistently counted on to vote the right way and to take steps, proactive steps, in support of Palestinian rights. This is really an unprecedented development in the history of the politics of our country, and I think a hugely encouraging sign. Lastly, and I'll end with this, 
The third reason why I believe that Israel's apartheid regime over the Palestinian people will not last is because BDS is winning and efforts to repress BDS are failing. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the acronym BDS, I know we tend to be a little bit uh, acronymy about this, if that's a word, which I know it's not. BDS, of course, stands for Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions, a call which came from 170 Palestinian civil society organizations in 2005, urging and demanding people of conscience around the world to implement these campaigns against Israel, against corporations that are profiting from Israel's abuse of the Palestinian people, and against institutions that are complicit in propping up Israel's apartheid regime. And since that call came out, you know, there's a, there's a dictum that's often attributed to Gandhi, but there's no proof that he actually said it. But it's often attributed to him. So they, first, they uh, ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. And I remember when this call for BDS came out in 2005, Israel and supporters paid it no attention. But then they saw that people were starting to organize around this and that it was picking up some mild successes. And then they started to deride it. Oh, it's nothing. It's not serious. It's not going to lead to anything fundamental. We're not worried. But now that's not the case at all. We are clearly into the phase where Israel has thrown everything into the battle to try to stop this nascent Palestinian civil society-led movement. And they're still failing to do so. We've seen over the past few years gigantic multinational corporations pull out of business entirely in Israel, not just the occupied Palestinian territory, pull out of business entirely in Israel due to pressure from global civil society. Corporations like the British G4S providing uh, private prison training and services. The French multinational firm Veolia, which provides wastewater management and garbage pickup and other infrastructural type of services, which was doing so for some of Israel's settlements. We've seen these corporations lose billions of dollars of potential contracts because of BDS pressure, and they've made the economic, not the moral decision, you know what, it's really not worth it for us to continue to have a little bit of business in Israel if this is the pushback that we are going to get. And this is the business opportunities we're going to have to forsake in order to do this business with Israel. So they're pulling out of the market. We've seen Oscar award winners refuse to go on propaganda trips to Israel. We've seen Grammy award winning musicians like Lauren Hill and Lord cancel concerts in Israel in response to people making moral appeals to them to not perform. We've seen NFL players refuse propaganda trips by Israel to their great embarrassment. We've seen nine church denominations in the United States either pass resolutions to boycott Israeli settlement products and or divest their holdings from companies like Caterpillar, like Motorola, that are profiting from Israeli military occupation. We've seen academic associations like the American Studies Association pass BDS resolutions, and we've seen dozens of student governments pass resolutions on U.S. college campuses demanding that their university not invest in companies that are profiting from Israel's abuse of the Palestinian people. All of this amounts to an unprecedented civil society mobilization for Palestinian rights not only in the United States, but globally. Now, I mentioned these four stages that are often attributed to Gandhi in the, in the process of social change. In 2015, I believe it was, the Israeli president, Ruven Rivlin, said that BDS is, quote, a strategic threat of the highest degree to Israel. It was placed on a par with Iran developing nuclear weapons. That's how seriously Israel now takes this Palestinian-led civil society movement. And in fact, the Israeli government has allocated roughly $25 million per year to its Ministry of Strategic Affairs in an attempt to kill the BDS movement worldwide. 
And as part of these efforts to kill the BDS movement worldwide, we've seen what Israel and its supporters do best in the United States, which is try to marshal its grass top support in a very heavy handed effort to legislate against our right as citizens to participate and organize these type of campaigns. So we've seen now more than two dozen states pass laws that attempt to penalize individuals and businesses that support the boycott of Israel. We've seen legislation introduced in Congress, the Israel Anti-Boycott Act, that would impose a 20-year imprisonment on individuals if they provide information to an international organization to support a boycott of Israel or just Israeli settlement goods. That's the bad side of things. We've seen these attempts to repress, but the good news is that not only are they failing to dissuade people from engaging in their constitutionally protected right to engage in these type of campaigns, but we're now seeing an overreach. We've seen that they've gone too far and that they've turned the tide of public opinion against them in this effort. APAC's top legislative priority in 2017 was passage of the Israel Anti-Boycott Act. The ACLU came out with an extremely important letter saying that it is constitutionally First Amendment protected speech for people to engage in these boycott campaigns and the government cannot pass efforts to restrict Americans' right to engage in these campaigns. And because of that letter, and because of the mobilization of civil society against this bill, we have actually been able to stymie this bill from being passed for a whole year. So much for the invincibility of APAC. And on the state level, I also have good news to report. Because just yesterday, after the ACLU had filed a lawsuit against Kansas for one of these anti-BDS laws, a judge imposed an injunction forbidding Kansas from implementing this law and reaffirming that, yes, it is our First Amendment protected right to engage in these type of boycotts. So number three, BDS is winning. Efforts to repress the BDS movement are losing. And as long as we continue to engage in the type of difficult but sustained political power building in which we are engaged, and we continue to engage in these campaigns for BDS, and Israel continues to delegitimize itself through its racist policies, then I have no doubt, no doubt, that Israel's separate and unequal policies toward the Palestinian people will collapse, paving the way for freedom, justice, and equality. Thank you. Thank you for the lovely speech you had today. Um, in the wake of uh, President uh, Trump's shocking decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, there has been a, um, uh, a movement, I know it is a small movement, even among some Palestinian leaders, for a unified state as a solution. How likely is this to happen? What is your thinking of a unified state? Mm -hmm. um, uh, thank you. Great, sure. Do you want to take a couple at a time and I'll answer them together? No, one at a time. One at a time. I was going to ask uh, basically the same question. Uh, can a Jewish state uh, be legitimate as you have already documented. So isn't the one state with equal rights the only solution now? How can Israel as a Jewish state be democratic? Right. Right. Okay. Should we take a third? 
Hi, uh, Rachel Oswald, Congressional Quarterly. When you look at the likely uh, Democratic presidential field in 2020, what are you seeing in terms of early signs of positioning from potential candidates, whether it's signing on to letters or not signing on to BDS-related bills or anything that catches your eye? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, uh, great, great questions. So uh, as a, as a non-Palestinian, I don't feel that it's my prerogative or my right to uh, advocate for a, a particular resolution to, to the Israeli-Palestinian issue. So if, if you ask me, you know, whether publicly I support two states or one state, it's really, it's really not my call. But as, as an analyst of the situation, I think it's very clear that Israel has created the conditions in which, and has declared quite openly, that there will never be a Palestinian state. So uh, I think, uh, as you mentioned, that there is uh, the beginning of this rethinking both within Palestinian civil society and in political leadership bodies of the uh, validity of continuing along the, the process that was begun in 1988 with the Declaration of Independence and the two-state paradigm. Uh, I think, you know, right now it's, it's, it's very difficult politically, I think, for the Palestinian side to come out politically and say we're abandoning two states because of all the, the, the scorn that's heaped upon them already for not returning to the non-existent negotiating table uh, that they face right now from, from the Trump administration. But, I mean, clearly, I mean, the Obama administration on its way out the door made it quite clear that, and this is one area in which I agreed with the uh, analysis of the Obama administration, is that this status quo is untenable, that something is going to uh, give. And, and I don't know what that situation uh, will, will be. I mean, Gaza, according to the United Nations, will be uninhabitable by human beings in 2020. It's just two years away. So what is going to happen to the two million people who currently live there today when they can no longer live there due to uh, you know, lack of water, lack of access to food, lack of access to sanitation under Israel's blockade. Well, they're not simply going to sit there and wait to die. So something's going to give. Something's got to break. And uh, I think that while things are likely to be stuck in this stasis during the Trump administration, however long that lasts, we'll see what Bob Mueller comes up with in his investigation, uh, I, I don't think it lasting beyond 2020 uh, is, is very realistic. I think there will be very changed political circumstances, potentially even next year, if Congress flips. And uh, if a Democrat uh, inhabits the White House in 2020, I think you could see a very different political calculation. And David, your question about you know, whether Israel can be both Jewish and Democratic at the same time, uh, the answer is no. Uh, you know, the United States uh, can't be a white nation and not discriminate against people of color. It can't define itself that way. Uh, so Adala, the Legal Center for Minority Rights in Israel, has a database of more than 50 discriminatory laws within Israel that are imposed on Palestinian citizens of Israel that render Palestinian citizens of Israel second class, at best, citizens in their own country. Uh, Adala, it's A-D-A-L-A-H. Uh, which means justice in, in, in Arabic. So, no, you have had at the heart of Israel for the last 70 years a fundamental contradiction between Jewish and democratic, uh, and it can't be both. It has to choose um, either a theological, um, nationalist, um, exclusivist identity or democracy. It can't be both. It's, it's as simple as that. Uh, regarding the 2020 elections, uh, it's very interesting. So there's probably about a dozen or two dozen uh, viable names that have been thrown into the ring so far, some of which, some of whom have uh, since departed from the political scene uh, because of sexual harassment. Um, so it's narrowed a little bit, but uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting because uh, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand is someone who's often talked about as a potential 2020 candidate for the Democrats. And this summer, in response to pressure from constituents, 
she actually took her name off of the Israel anti-boycott bill. She was a sponsor, and then she dropped off, citing these First Amendment concerns and the concerns of her constituents um, at, at, at the draconian nature of this bill. Another senator who's talked about for 2020 on the Democratic side is Cory Booker of New Jersey. Uh, he was excoriated by the right-wing press for not supporting in committee the Taylor Force Act, which would cut off all aid, with a few exceptions, to the Palestinian Authority uh, for the payments that it makes to, to Palestinians' uh, families who have relatives either imprisoned or killed uh, in, in confrontation with Israel. He didn't vote for that because he thought it was, it was too draconian, that it was actually not in Israel's interest, is what he said. And so there's a very interesting article. I forget, I forget which uh, publication it was in. I think it was New York, New York Post, maybe. And it, and, and it said, oh, the viable Democratic uh, candidates for 2020 are, are, are tripping over each other to throw Israel under the bus. You know, Mitt Romney's charge of what Obama uh, was doing, supposedly, uh, back during the, um, the 2012 campaign. Uh, I think that's far from the truth. I don't think Democratic candidates are tripping over themselves to throw Israel uh, under the bus, but I do think that the political conditions within the Democratic Party are being created so that you can't have another Hillary Clinton type of position toward Israel, that it just won't be tenable uh, for a Democratic presidential candidate to be espousing these types of lockstep, uh, I support Israel type of positions and you know I think Senator Bernie Sanders deserves a lot of credit for breaking this open and uh, shattering the taboo of discussing this at the highest levels within the party uh, in his presidential run of, of 2016. So uh, it's encouraging. Uh, we've definitely got our eye on, on the different candidates and uh, you know we talked to a lot of them and, and, their, and their staff you know in their positions as, as members of Congress uh, and you know of, of the 40 or so that I mentioned emerging as, as a block, I think there are, are some in there who might throw their hat into the ring for, for 2020. Absolutely. Okay, should we do uh, another round? We have seven, six minutes left. I just wanted to add a qu sure. just quick comment. I don't know if you saw, uh, but you mentioned earlier uh, Salim Gibran, who was the, uh, frequently cited as proof of Israel's democracy. But today, just I saw something that he refuses to sing the, the national anthem because of the fact that it um, mentions Jew, you know, that it's for Jewish people. Uh, so I just thought that was interesting that he, uh, that he came out and said, you know, uh, it, it can't expect all the Arab citizens to respect the anthem if it doesn't respect their rights. But Great talk, Josh. Um, I'm Michael Thomas. Uh, and great news from Kansas, the ACLU case. There have been some setbacks, though, and I wanted you to, to speak to three kinds. Uh, one, the uh, New Orleans City Council reversing its position against uh, um, uh, in favoring BDS. Um, I think it's Pennsylvania that uh, forced uh, divestiture uh, from its pension plan of, of uh, uh, a Danish bank because the Danish bank wouldn't do business in the, in the, in the territories. Um, and a number of schools have uh, had bodies take positions and then back off, uh, usually under accusations of anti-Semitism. And I know the Adelsons and others are pouring money into efforts on campus. Can, can you speak to those situations and, and the way forward on those? Um, my name is Marcel. Um, so after Trump was elected, um, Secretary of Defense Mattis actually came out publicly and said that he believed that settlements are an obstacle to peace. Mm -hmm. And Michael Flynn, who is no longer politically with us, also echoed a similar sentiment. And when, the, when they were appointed, combined with other statements Trump had made about, uh, say, letting Assad stay in power, it was somewhat promising for me as one of those 6% of Republicans. But do you think that our national security establishment is slowly... Um, taking our side on Israel, and do you think that will have any effects moving forward? Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. One more. Uh, thank you. Do you see any hope 
for change within Israel itself. Do we want to try squeezing the last remaining hands? Sure. Uh, I don't know if we have time for that, but uh, what about the press? Maybe my impression is the press generally in the U.S. is is moving into a more balanced assessment or presentation on the situation. It's really, really quite good. Uh, is is that a correct impression from your perspective? Mm -hmm. Um, apropos of the um, uh, erosion of the patina of uh, democracy, I was surprised to um, read yesterday that um, uh, a very large movement of Israeli Jews is, in fact, um, opposing the um, expulsion of, of the African refugees. And... Um, the, you know, there was some question about whether, I mean, is this a desperate effort to save that patina? Mm -hmm. uh, is it because there, um, the African uh, refugees only number about 40,000 people, um, whatever. But I'm, I'm curious how you view that particular um, movement in, um, in line with my friend and colleague's question about um, is there, does this indicate any kind of hope within Israeli society? Yeah. Uh, okay. Great. Let me let me try to uh, get some answers into these great questions before we have to break. Uh, no doubt, there there are setbacks along the road, and there have been instances, as you as you uh, correctly point out, where forces in support of BDS have been overturned. But I think the New Orleans case is very instructive because there you had a very simply worded resolution that was initiated by the New Orleans Palestine Solidarity Committee in coalition with about 20 other community organizations simply saying that the cities should set up a process so that they ensure that city contracts aren't going to companies with human rights or labor abuses to their name. It didn't mention Israel. Palestinians, nothing in the resolution. And uh, the New Orleans Palestine Solidarity Committee rightfully took credit for getting this passed unanimously through the city council. And two weeks later, it was unanimously overturned after pressure from the uh, Anti-Defamation League, whose only job these days is to defame anyone who speaks up for Palestinian rights, and uh, the Jewish Federation or the JCRC, Jewish Community Relations Council there in, in New Orleans, I'm not sure of the exact bodies. But those institutions would rather sacrifice the global principle of respect for human rights as a guiding uh, principle animating how the city should contract rather than even open the door crack to having any measure of accountability for Israel. So they're willing to throw the whole human rights infrastructure under the bus for the sake of protecting Israeli apartheid. And believe me, the community in response saw exactly how things work and exactly where these forces line up. And it's again contributing to this process of understanding that the Israeli cause is a very right-wing anti-human rights issue in the uh, U.S. political spectrum. So yes, it was a setback, but there are silver linings to every cloud. Um, in my earlier book about Obama's policies, uh, I did a whole chapter on that issue about uh, what the national security establishment is thinking and feeling uh, on this issue. It's a bit dated now since uh, you know a lot of those players are, are no longer gone, but there's a very uh, interesting testimony by David Petraeus when he was head of CENTCOM. I forget the exact year. I think it was 20, 2010 or 2011 where he testified in front of Congress that Israel's a drag on our security interests in the area that I'm responsible for. And oh, did that raise uh, the ire of Israel and the Israel lobby when, when he said that. Now look, that being said, no president did anything in history greater than President Obama to increase the amount of collusion that we have with Israel's military and that suppression of the Palestinian people. I mean, George Bush taking $30 billion and allocating it to Israel over 10 years was dwarfed by what Obama did when in 2016 he negotiated a deal for $38 billion. So 
yes, it's great that you have these viewpoints coming up from within the national security establishment challenging the notion that support for Israel is somehow good for American security, but nevertheless, the relationships between the Pentagon, between the weapons manufacturers, between the Israeli government and military and its weapons manufacturers has never been closer. Um, do I have hope for change within Israel? Uh, no. I don't. Uh, you know, if, if I were around and organizing on the, on the issue of apartheid in South Africa, I probably wouldn't have hope for white South African society accepting the notion of transitioning to democracy. And in fact, if you look at the public opinion polling from white apartheid society in South Africa back in the 1980s and even up to the early 1990s, support for the idea of a transition democracy was less than 10% among white South Africans. But sometimes the oppressor doesn't get to decide the political outcome. Sometimes things change and resolutions get imposed on them whether they like it or not. Uh, I don't, I'm not saying that that's where we're heading, but I think it's a, it's a possibility that we will be going down that route uh, within this generation. Um, yes, we are seeing better media coverage right now, thanks in part to, thanks in large part to the uh, Institute for Middle East Understanding, which does an amazing job of getting uh, Palestinian and pro-Palestinian voices into the press in this country. And then uh, finally, on the issue of uh, African asylum seekers uh, in Israel, you know, it's really a, a sad and, and disturbing story. It's like 20 to 40,000 people who have fled from, from their lives from, you know, starvation situations or war situations, terrible human rights atrocities. You know, the Israel lobby was up in arms about um, Sudan's genocide uh, in the last decade. And a lot of these refugees and asylum seekers are, are, are fleeing that violence uh, from Sudan, and they're treated abysmally in Israel. They're subject to pogroms, where under the uh, instigation of Israeli governmental ministers, you actually have Israeli Jews literally like running down the street trying to round up and beat uh, African asylum seekers who live mainly in Tel Aviv. Others have been transported to this desert uh, detention center uh, and it's, it's, it's raising all kinds of concerns within Israeli societies because of parallels to the Holocaust, especially now that the Israeli government has put out a bounty for vigilantes to round up African uh, asylum seekers and, and place them in detention. It's really quite shocking that a society uh, that in large measure is composed of people who are descendants of Holocaust survivors can even contemplate policies like that. So yes, this triggers very historical emotional reactions among some Israeli Jews and the more liberal ones are uh, opposed to, you know, the various very obvious uh, parallels that, that are being drawn. But, um, you know, I don't think that that type of sympathy and empathy that's being demonstrated toward uh, African asylum seekers amongst some segments of Israeli society has any transition over to how Israeli Jews think about um, Palestinians who are seen, um, to be frank, not, not as full human beings, deserving of human rights by the vast, vast majority uh, of Israeli Jewish society. I hate to leave it on that down uh, point, but I appreciate you coming um, so much. Thank you to the Palestine Center for hosting. <laughs>